Essentials of Life, Air and Water. Welcome back. We're going to cover the biological water quality parameters, and we're going to probably focus mostly here on microbiological because in environmental health science, our major focus is human health, even though we're aware that things that impact the environment and animal life can definitely have uh, impacts on us. So, on this cover slide, you know, this isn't spelled right. Um, it's spelled correctly, I guess. It's not formatted right. We're going to talk about in the sciences how we do our writing formatting here in a little bit. But um, before we get into the microbiological parameters, I just want to let you see visually the different pollution-sensitive and pollution-like intolerant organisms. So there are these things called caddisflies um, that can live in the water. They have their own little houses that they build out of very specific twigs and sticks. Um, sometimes they make cases out of rocks. Um, so they are very pollution sensitive usually. So their absence sometimes indicates problems. There are mayflies that are particularly sensitive to metals. So like canaries in a coal mine that would die when things got too bad, um, when things get too rough for mayflies and they disappear, that might indicate a problem. We have, um, I think red-bellied dace, rainbow darters, um, there are stoneflies, um, we've got a variety of darters that live in our streams in Kentucky. All these things that you see up here live in our rivers and streams in Kentucky. And these are examples of pollution sensitive or pollution intolerant organisms. All right, we're gonna move now into the microorganisms. And first speaking about bacteria. Um, in public health, we generally, in the water, we measure a lot of aerobic bacteria. We also measure anaerobic ones too, but we have to, they don't culture, they don't do well in culture as easy. Aerobic use oxygen. Anaerobic do not use oxygen. We may measure anaerobic DNA from bacteria that live in the guts of animals, like Bacteroides fragilis is very specific to the human gut. It does not like oxygen, so it doesn't live in the environment. So if you measure it, you have to measure its DNA, not necessarily measure, try to grow them or culture them. We measure oxygen-based microbiota, like E. coli. There are some microorganisms that can do both. Facultative anaerobes, they can live in oxygen conditions or anoxic, conditions that lack oxygen, like anaerobic. The presence or absence of certain bacteria can be suggestive of a potential for human health risk. It's important to know not all bacteria are pathogens. And in fact, most bacteria are beneficial or are what we call commensals. Examples of bad ones are disease-causing agents that we would call pathogens. So most bacteria are good for us. They keep our skin moist. They help us digest our food. People eat some of them, like lactobacillus, in their food. Without bacteria, we wouldn't be able to survive on this planet. So most bacteria are good, but there are a few that are bad. Some bacteria are good but get a bad reputation because we use them as an indicator or because a few members of their group may make people sick. So... With regards to indicator bacteria, all these are examples of some indicator bacteria of fecal contamination. Total coliforms and fecal coliforms being one, but E. coli being a great example of a fecal indicator bacteria. And then we have some pathogens like Salmonella typhi. There are species of this bacterial genus called Campylobacter. There's certain ones that are pathogens. There are certain bacteria called archobacters. There's a whole range of bacteria that can be pathogenic or have members that are pathogenic. And there are also viruses too, which we'll talk about maybe here in a minute. 
When we write out bacteria names, or even animal names, like birds, or tree names, the genus is capitalized. The species name of the specific epithet is lowercase. And since we've got computers these days, we italicize. The first time these things ever show up in a scientific paper or in a report, they're wrote out long ways. Then, after the first appearance in a paper, it can be shortened to this, E. coli. Before, Escherichia coli, all right? Old school, or if you're doing it by hand. Back when we had typewriters, that's when we do the underlining of it. But now, we've got the ability to italicize. So old school, or if writing by hand, that's what you would do. So, common mistakes. What's wrong with this one? Not italicized. What's wrong with this one? It's underlined. What's wrong with this one? Not italicized. What's wrong with this one? Where's our big E? We need to be big E here. This one needs our big E. All right. Moving on into the indicator aspects of fecal indicator bacteria. And there's a mistake on this one that I'm going to cover here in a second. First, Total coliforms, it's a big, big group, all right? Within that big, big group are the fecal coliforms. And within the fecal coliforms are E. coli. Give you the bigger picture. And I can break this, bring this back. Think about uh, maple trees. So the big group of all the trees. Some of the trees are deciduous trees. Some are coniferous trees. But we'll say all the deciduous trees. It's a big circle. And then within that, we have the maple trees. Within the maple trees, we may have the group that's most closely related to like the red maples. So red maples and silver maples. There may be another group that's more closely related to the sugar maples. So that's the sugar maples and the black maples. They fit into that group. So with like that, we've got this big group of all the bacteria. This is not to scale because the total coliforms are probably a smaller group. But we've got this huge group of bacteria that are called coliforms. They all have some similarities. They like to grow in conditions that are warmer than, I think, about 22 degrees. Um, they're gram negative um they can lactose ferment they ferment lactose or whatever so many of these can survive in the gut of animals but they also can live in nature as well now within this group of coliforms some like it warmer some can grow all the way up to 44.5 degrees Celsius, or about, I don't know, it's about 120 degrees Fahrenheit, 130. They can live in like the guts of birds and warmer environments. These are the fecal coliforms. And then within the fecal coliform group, there are some that are E. coli. So there are other bacteria that are fecal coliforms that are not E. coli, but there's this group of E. coli. And then most E. coli are good for us. They help us digest our food. We have millions or billions or maybe even trillions of them things living in our gut. All humans. Animals have them. They help us digest our food. But certain ones sometimes get into animals and don't cause the animals any problems and they grow and replicate and do well. Like E. coli 0157 and they are toxic, toxic to us. They get into us to cause an infection, and then they re our body fights back. They start producing toxins. Their toxins our body doesn't like, causes bloody diarrhea, can cause sometimes kidney problems, 
We can't treat it with medication. We have to let people get better on their own because if we gave an antibiotic that killed all the toxic E. coli, they'd all die at once and release lots of toxic toxins that they've produced all at once. All their cells would rupture, all the toxins would release, and people can die from toxic shock. So there's the one strain, or a few strains, not one, a few strains of toxigenic E. coli. Most E. coli are good. Most fecal coliforms are good. Most total coliforms are good. Most bacteria are good. So, all right. Now, when we find coliforms in the environment, it tells us that, yeah, they're there. And their presence being there suggests that maybe the soil, water, or fecal contamination from animals has happened. The soil or water has been contaminated, possibly with fecal matter. Doesn't mean that it was, it just suggests. Fecal coliforms, these being present in the environment mean that these things probably came from something warmer. They may not be as likely to naturally occur, at least in this part of the, in the world. They can naturally occur more easily in like salt water, or not salt water, but like in beaches and the more tropical areas of the world. And then like even like Florida. So these things can indicate fecal contamination as well, but we don't measure them as much as we used to. Instead, E. coli gets most of the measurement attention. E. coli, there are special um, petri dishes and temperatures to grow them at, very warm temperatures. These plates are expensive. We would have done some of this in our lab if we had a chance. Um, the magenta colored colonies that grow on this petri dish are, are E. coli. Their presence indicates that fecal bacteria are likely present in the water. It doesn't mean that there's pathogens there, but you can imagine if fecal matter is there, then the risk for getting a fecal oral pathogen goes up. So their presence suggests fecal contamination. Fecal contamination could include not just bacteria, but viruses that may have been in the people or animals shedding the, the fecal matter into the water. So when we find E. coli, we generally assume it's from warm-blooded animals. And in our drinking water, we never want to find any E. coli. In swimming water, we tolerate up to 235 colony-forming units. 235 of these things per 100 milliliters of water. And there's a non-coliform called enterococci that they use in marine waters. And both E. coli and enterococci can get tested using an IDEX tray like that. There are many other indicators of, of fecal contamination, but these things do not grow in and or in oxygen or oxygenic environments, environments where there's oxygen, they don't grow in aerobic environments. These bacteroides, calococcus, they grow in the gut of these different animals, and people can measure their their DNA. There are other things in the water that we worry about. Our focus on the bacteria indicators. If we find high levels of more easily measurable things that are safer to measure then we can assume that some viruses or some parasites may be also in the water. There are fancy methods, like quantitative PCR. This is the same method that they're using for actually directly measuring the virus, the COVID-19 SARS coronavirus 2 virus, right? They're using qPCR. They have to take it from being an RNA virus to DNA and then amplifying it as a DNA, you know, but, you know, it's not easy to do. You have to have a lot of experience with this. There are easy ways for us to measure in the field and measure in labs how much E. coli is in the water. There are IDEX trays that are out there and coliform trays that are out there. But here's an example with uh, one of my former students and his cousins, um, and actually his brother and his cousin, but his cousins were there. Um, and we've got a, a kit that we're using to enumerate E. coli in their well water samples and cistern samples from where he lives. 
Um, so you can see a lot of blue meant a lot of coliforms. And then the ones that glow are not just coliforms, but more specifically, they're E. coli. And you still have to make these things get incubated. You want to warm them up so where they would cook their food, we'd keep them nearby so they could incubate. More recently, just, you know, a couple months ago, about three months ago, um, I got back from working with one of my students on a new method that we're developing. Um, and this is where I stayed. You know, this is where my one student, Nixon, this is where he grew up, this is where he lives. Um, he's a student at EKU, awesome, awesome young man, medical lab science student. Um, and he helped a lot on this project and wanted to do a project with me. So we went and we measured water quality. And it also got them to get back home too over over the break. Measured water quality from sources of water that people would collect for drinking and use for drinking where he's from. We then would take them back to this little small home that you know a kind of cabin that was staying in, um, and tested it right there. And you can see our lab set up here. We would take the water samples and then you have to put them into a tray mix them with the food, put them on this rubber thing, and run them through that machine. This machine's very expensive, almost $5,000. Um, the incubation, you have to use an incubator, so these glow lamps work really good. So a couple dollars worth of parts, we made the, made the lamp and made her go. We were able to get really warm temperatures. If you can get this up to 35 degrees Celsius, this stuff will work. And I also set the alarm in case it got too hot in there, it would beep so that I knew I was going to burn the place down. And you can see the IDEX method, how the coliforms were very numerous in the water, and then under the light, you can see the IDEX tray glowing. And I've got a method that I've developed that we've got proprietarily patented patented and you can see the E. coli under a black light glowing. So underneath the black light individually you can see how easy it is to enumerate the positive samples, the positive wells for having E. coli. This can tell us how much E. coli is in the water and you know a lot of folks in that area want to know. So generally as E. coli levels go up, the risk for gastrointestinal illness goes up. So it's important to know that. There are other methods that use membrane filtration where we have to filter the water across a you know a filter. The bacteria get caught on the surface. The water goes through it. We then take the filter and put it on the Petri dish and incubate it at 44 and a half degrees Celsius, which is about 120 some odd degrees Fahrenheit, and the E. coli grow. The problem with a lot of our methods, though, is from the time we take our sample, we do our filtration, we put it in the incubator, it does take like 24 hours or so before you can actually count the amount of bacteria in the water. So that's one of the limitations, this 18 to 24 hour time period. All right, so that kind of is a lot about the fecal indicator bacteria. The last kind of microorganism that we're interested in, when they get really numerous, you can see them, but these are cyanobacteria. And the most common cyanobacteria, um, or it was thought to be the most common cyanobacteria, there's some research changing now, was microcystis aeruginosa, and it produces these toxins called microcystins. So these toxins could kill dogs, um, people in some parts of the world who have to, had to drink a lot of their toxins over a lifetime in like Korea and in China have had liver problems. Even in the U.S., so there's some anecdotal evidence of people who have got water supplies near really frequent bloom-forming waters. They also have more non-alcoholic liver disease. So certain species are bloom-formers, and there are frequent advisories issued in the Midwest and occasionally in the Southeast where there's a lot of uh, fertilizers that get into the water. So even in Lake Reba, we've had problems with algal blooms from cyanobacteria. And then there's viruses that can get in water. Um, 
In order to measure them, we have to measure usually the DNA or the RNA virus material. The most common virus for making people sick worldwide are noroviruses. Um, they're also called cruise ship viruses. Um, these are very commonly spread. They weren't found until you know the 80s as the Khaleesi viruses and then the norovirus in particular. We're getting in the late 80s and early 90s when the first outbreaks were noticed and they were able to figure them out. But there are other viruses, adenoviruses, enteroviruses. So we don't measure these things because they're harder to measure. Like people do measure them, but from a public health standpoint, at the practice level, we measure the indicator bacteria um, just like we measure the indicator bacteria for parasites. These are hard to measure, to enumerate. So instead of enumerating the cryptosporidium and the giardia and the amoeba and that stuff, we sometimes use indicator species. So I'll probably just give you these review questions as part of a quiz assignment, and I'll stop it there. And um, that concludes our section on the basic intro to water quality. And we're going to then start getting into um, a lab on how, like an online lab on how you can detect uh, fecal bacteria and what those results mean. So some applied application here. And then we'll get into drinking water and wastewater determination. So that's all for now. Um, so the quiz questions will be mostly based off of these videos and these notes. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you.